Public events, we always start with a little safety announcement. I'm sorry we're living in an era now where that becomes more important. Um, uh, Andrew Hunter is your responsible safety officer, uh, and that means he's going to make sure you're taken care of if we have an emergency. If there is a problem, we're going to go right, this is the, the emergency exit right back here. Just go out this way, the stairs go down to the alley uh, right here in the side, and if there's a problem is out in the front, we're going to go to the back, and we'll meet across uh, the way in the courtyard for National Geographic. Uh, if the problem's in the back, we're going to go front, and we'll go down to St. Matthew's. And so just to let you know what the landscape is, nothing's going to happen, but I want to be prepared, and I know I want you to be prepared with us. So just follow Andrew. Um, thank you all very much for coming. This is uh, part of a series that we're undertaking to try to look at the... Um, the, the hidden side of the Defense Department. You know, you get all the drama about bombers and ICBMs and all that kind of stuff. But the day-to-day -day pulse of the department is really quite different, and we wanted to shine a light on that. It doesn't get the normal attention, and frankly, say, there are some pretty big issues that are inside of that. So we, we had uh, Bill Lynn was here to talk about, you know, the parochialism of our security environment and how it chokes off opportunities to draw on uh, companies that are not heritage companies but have to live under exceptional security procedures which, uh, which are really blocking uh, knowledge for us. We, uh, let's see, we had, a, we had a very good session with um, um, rethinking the, uh, Wes Bush had a session with us about how do we do R&D and there's a great deal of pressure right now on uh, IRAD. Um, lots of emotion, not a lot of substance and we've got to kind of get our hands around what does this mean? If we want to change IRAD, what will we do? We had a very good session uh, with Alan Shavatkin on the legal environment that's emerging. I mean, it's, uh, we're, we're seeing some uh, lawyers in Justice Department that are trying to say you submit a product that didn't pass a test, that that's, that's a case of uh, fraudulent billing. You know, that, uh, you know, well, that's a crazy goddamn idea. You know, if you talk about want to poison the well for uh, the Defense Department, make every contractor think that they face criminal penalties when they submit a, a product, you know, for testing. I mean, uh, so we, we, we got to get our arms around that. That's a dumb idea. Uh, we had a, we had a um, very good session looking beyond the, the budget. Last week it was with Dave Melcher. We were saying, well, we're going to be living with these sequester caps, and yet we're one department that has to make concrete plans that uh, last for five years. Well, what's our horizon? What can we really count on? So it was quite good sessions. Today is uh, a topic I've asked my old friend Pierre Chow to come and get us, get us launched on this. And we're going to talk about uh, what does it mean for industry to compete for capital? And what, does, what is the implication of that? Now, I will, I'll tell you, when I was the Deputy Secretary of Defense and the Comptroller before, I didn't have a clue what that meant. And I made a lot of mistakes because of that. I mean, it is not something in the consciousness of my beloved Defense Department to think about the, you know, capital structure associated with companies. And what do they have, what does it mean for them? All of a sudden, if a company is competing in the public marketplace for capital because it says, does, it, does that matter to us in DOD? Most people in DOD don't even think about it. They say, what's the point? We got billions of dollars. That's, that's not at all what it's going on. And it was not anything I understood. I was embarrassed to say I had to learn on the job. And I, one of my teachers was Pierre Chow and uh, had to come to understand it makes a big difference for a business what its capital structure is and how government policy affects capital structure. This is an important topic of discussion, not well understood in Washington. So we're going to dig into that today. Pierre is going to launch us on this. And then, Frank, I want to say thank you, especially for coming. I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, I could give you a long introduction of Pierre Chow. Uh, all I can tell you is he married one of the most remarkable young ladies in town. Unfortunately, she's still in the defense business, and Pierre is going to make sure she has a as a retirement. So, I mean, so Pierre, thank you for coming today, and we're delighted to have you. And why don't you get us started with, the, with your opening remarks? Thank you. 
Thank you, John. Um, so today is uh, sort of one of our favorite topics, which is the issue of, of national security and, and uh, junction with the, with the capital markets. Um, I think the way that we want to start talking about it, though, is by establishing a little bit of a framework, because this is one of those topics that's, I think, very much subject to the dilemma and the problem of multiple threads running through it, um, confusion of those, and a lot of times, um, uh, times where there are policy prescriptions generated, uh, they're often aimed at the wrong problem, uh, and that's often uh, the, the source of, of many of the issues. So w just to orient ourselves, we want to kind of start with the notion that industries go through life cycles. There's been a lot of work on this by James Utterback at MIT and other people. The curve should look familiar because it looks almost like a programmatic chart or a programmatic curve. And it has the central notion and the most important one that there are going to be different policies and, and different dynamics driving through an industry as it, as it evolves through this life cycle. So there's an entry and experimentation phase of an industry. If you think about the aircraft industry in the 1910s, 1920s, um, companies, there were multiple companies, multiple technologies, airplanes with one wings, two wings, three wings, engines in the front, in the back, um, aircraft made of paper, aluminum, wood, etc. Right? The UAV industry of today is probably the equivalent one, or if you want to think about the cyber industry. There's ultimately the emergence of a standard design or a dominant design. Ah, got it. Monocoque hull, engines in the front, swept wings work really well, and aluminum's a nice uh, is a nice, nice material to use, right? And uh, uh, you see this emergence of a standard or dominant design throughout all industries. The, the QWERTY keyboard, which is one of the most insane keyboards ever, you know, made up, was the the dominant design that that came out, and we all happily use it today. Then you begin to get a shake out of the industry. Almost by definition, once there's the emergence of the standard design, those that don't match the standard design start to drop away. You will get natural consolidation of an industry. That was one of the key points um, that's underway. And ultimately, you hit a stability and decline fa phase. And if this was a normal commercial industry, you would restart the cycle right um, uh, uh, back again. One of the other key things to note is whenever somebody sits there and says, I want a lot of innovation, the first question that, should shoot, that you should shoot back is what kind? Product innovation is really important on the left-hand side of the curve. Process innovation is more important on the right-hand side of the curve. It makes no sense to invest in process innovation if you're going to be turning over the product or changing the technology at a fast clip or you haven't determined what you want to settle in on, right? I don't want a super efficient, in some ways, UAV plant until I figure out that that's the UAV I'm going to be buying for the next 20 years, right? As long as I'm changing the technology a lot. Or probably even more pointedly, a set of algorithms, you know, for cyber that I'm locked into until I'm sure what it is. On the other hand, if you're on the right-hand side of the curve, investing in a new product design to the extent that we're locked in unless it's about to restart the curve is also probably not as useful as figuring out how to drop the cost, right? And so the example that I often use is, more, is actually more tied to the commercial aerospace industry. Um, if you think about it, there are three technological axes by which the, the industry has evolved. Um, speed, range, and, um, and size. So size, we have commercial aircraft that can fit 500 people all the way down to one person. We're not going to go to triple-decked airplanes or double-bubbled side-by-side. We've probably filled out all the niches in terms, of, uh, in terms of size. Speed, we've been stuck at 0.98 Mach since the 70s, 80s. In fact, that's the big technological revolution everybody's trying for. Can I get a commercially viable supersonic uh, uh, commercial jet? And in range, the 777 can go halfway around the world. If you want to go further, you go in the other direction, right? So spending an inordinate amount of money in order to push the technological edge doesn't get you anything. And if you think about some of the military technologies that we have, we're hitting that period where we're hitting the asymptotic part of the curve in terms of cost versus capability, right? And so one of the hardest things to do in some ways is to be honest with yourselves in terms of where we are in this curve. And if one wants to be really blunt, if you take a look at the technologies that are on the mature side, those are technologies that showed up in the 1930s and 1940s. 
The technologies in the middle are those that showed up in the 60s, and the ones on the left are the ones that we're trying to insert into the, you know, into the, into the, the system today. Do not confuse maturity with high or low technology. That's often done that, that way. I can have an extremely high technology mature industry, right? The other thing that we, um, the dilemma that we have with our particular community is that uh, the defense community does happen to fight with the things off the right-hand side of the curve, right? Usually we don't have curves, curves moving rapidly enough to introduce them into the fight of today. And so when we boil down and come down to issues like the one that we're about to discuss today, which is how do I attract capital markets, how do I ensure I have a quote-unquote healthy industry, I have to ask back very quickly which industry and at what part of the curve are they on because they, there's a different dilemma across each of the different parts of, uh, um, uh, uh, across the different parts of the curve. Um, and you can do that across almost all the policy dilemmas that are out there relative to defense industrial issues. So when somebody sits there and says, I have a human capital problem, I have to ask, well, which one? All right, the human capital problem on the left-hand side of the curve is about STEM education and attracting, educa uh, attracting PhDs who are these days more than 50% foreign-born and is supposed to staying here, they're going back home. Right? That, that, that is one kind of human capital problem. The human capital problem on the right-hand side of the curve is how do I keep that last batch of nu nuclear qualified welders active when, I'm, only, when I'm, I'm producing at a very low rate or not enough of a rate in order to sustain them. Right? And the same thing in terms of market dynamics. You want a lot of competition on the left-hand side. You're faced with duopolies, monopolies, you know, far less competition on the right-hand side, and artificially trying to introduce them may not be the right way, right? unless, again, you're ready to restart the entire curve. And so when you also raise the topic of, I have a capital markets problem, I have to ask back which one, right? because it's going to differ whether you're on the left-hand side, the middle of the curve, or the right-hand side of the curve. And so for the next sort of 10 minutes or so, using this framework, I wanted to sort of walk through um, uh, what we see as some of the topics that have been coming up and what we're facing with as we, as we run through the, uh, uh, through the industry. If you start on the left-hand side of the curve, um, the technologies of today, the innovation challenge, you know, you can pick your euphemism in terms of, of, of what you want to call it. But there are the, the multiple issues, I think, that have come to the forefront that you're seeing the Secretary of Defense um, and uh, uh, Frank Kendall as ATNL trying to address with the innovation issue are really more about left-hand side of the curve issues. And the dilemma here in terms of access to growth or access to innovative technologies and the concern that we are losing access to those innovative technologies and that they're going more global, more commercial than they, than they have ever in the past is for sure a left-hand side of the curve type of dilemma. Um, there are some extant realities, though, about what I call the sort of startup you know, ecology that I would argue have more to do with the dilemma that the Pentagon is having in some ways um, that boil down to being cultural issues rather than economic ones or others, right? And so I sit there and, and usually ask if this was a government audience and they sit there and say, I, again, I have a dilemma with um, how to attract innovation and boy, if I just had a, uh, uh, a big incutel for the Department of Defense or different you know, uh, mechanisms by which to put capital in, my first set of questions back is, how many of you guys here are wearing ties and made me wear a tie today in order to deal with you? How many of you actually have socks? For some reason, millennials don't wear socks. Um, I don't understand that. Um, at least in my firm, they don't. Um, how many of you have three layers of management between you know, yourself and the engineer on the ground? I would submit those are the elements that probably stand as much in the way between the ability to access Silicon Valley and the Department of Defense than whether there is or isn't enough money, you know, in the grand scheme of things. It, and which is why, in some ways, it, it, it's, it's somewhat of a, of a deeper dilemma because they're, they're cultural issues. And the most, you know, the tie wearing one is the trivial one. The most significant one is the layers of management and the command and control structure 
right, that we are used to relative to anything else that's going on in corporate America, which is about flattening down, you know, the layers of management and going to very, very horizontal um, types of organizations versus vertical. The other element is, you know, can we attract these emerging technologies that are actually going more global as the key? So there is a major initiative underway in order to reach out to Silicon Valley, which you have to applaud as a good start, but you have to underline the word start because Silicon Valley was frankly of 10 years ago in some ways. These days it's as, more, as important to be in SOMA of San Francisco, Silicon Alley in downtown Manhattan, the Research Triangle in North Carolina, 128 is still active, right, if you want to talk about biotech, let alone Seoul, Geneva, dare I say Shanghai, um, Singapore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And again, once again, part of the dilemma in terms of accessing the levels of innovation is less about capital in some ways than it is about the willingness to go to the right places and address the right communities and, and touch them, right? Now, there are true barriers to entry issues and acquisition reform issues that are impinging, right? We have simultaneously underway an effort to reach out to the innovative centers of America and asking the, and the desire to tap into commercial technology, while exactly at the same time I'm having debates inside the building about taking away intellectual property of contractors, about issues relative to commercial of a type, and, uh, and, de and trying to define that away. Battles about uh, uh, the desire to, to want to do deeper analysis of, of cost, um, uh, and even related to fixed price contracts. And yet I guarantee you that if you went to these guys and asked them what is the cost of this watch, they would tell you, you know, forget you, I'm not gonna tell you what that is. And you, do you think this watch is worth what you paid for it? If you do, you should be very happy with what you bought, right? And the more that, that we try to engage with a commercial world that works that way and yet impinge our mechanisms, the more there will be a gap and I don't care how much money you throw at the problem. If you cannot solve this dilemma, um, you're not gonna get any movement in the grand scheme of things. And so, the, and it has not escaped the attention, frankly, of Silicon Valley and the, and I, I'll use them as a, as a euphemism, um, or that community, um, the fact that at the same time that we are reaching out to them, they are, they, they are sophisticated enough and savvy enough to see the other dilemmas that, that the, I would say, the traditional defense industry or those who are inside the system, you know, are having to deal with, right? The one exception to the rule is going to be the places where the Department of Defense decides that they are happy and willing to buy things commercially according to commercial practices. And there's been a natural evolution over time where you know, certain technologies, once they get mature enough, are redefined um, and are bought commercially. So once upon a time, there used to be a mil spec. I've actually seen it for brownies and for you know, food and other things, and today we gladly buy it commercially, right? Um, and so if we decide that we wanna buy web services commercially and, you, and you're willing to buy it you know, truly off the shelf without a requirement, uh, document, et cetera, then there will be an opening of the world to the commercial sector. The instant you change and impose a requirement, then we're in it, and then almost by definition, you're redefining that community as part of the defense industry, quote unquote. Um, all of these efforts, which are interesting to the extent of trying to draw capital in, or, or people in, still run into the valley of death issue that once you have them in and we develop a technology or we get to the point where, an where technology becomes interesting, transitioning that to a program of record or into full-scale production still remains extremely difficult and we have yet to sort of work on mechanisms by which to do that. And so one of the dilemmas and one of the things why you don't see, frankly, as many venture capitalists playing yet, pure venture capitalists playing purely in defense is because of this dilemma of I don't see the pathway of once I have the technology proven out, 
the, the mechanism by which I take that to full-scale production and, and from which I get to, quote-unquote, win um, or, or in a return on my, on my investment. And so for the traditional venture capital model of look at 100 companies, skim it down to 10, out of the 10, I have one huge home run, I take three or four failures, and four to six, you know, middling, and I've got some venture capitalists in the room, so who could sort of tell me that that's, that's actually the happy end of the model. In defense, you rarely have that 100 bagger, you know, that makes up for all those losses. You may have doubles or triples, and so the dynamics are completely different, and hence, there, there is a, there's a structural differential um, and that valley of death, which makes it very difficult to find the hundred bagger to you know to come across, um, I think is one of the issues. The place where the that community is more than happy to play is in dual use technologies, where the technology could be developed under defense, but the hundred bagger quote unquote comes out of the commercial world, which is why there's as much interest in large data analytics, you know, as an area where people see that, and. Today, cyber, it's interesting. Five years ago, you couldn't get a VC or you get very few VCs to look at cyber. Today, they're throwing you know, money at cyber. So the last statistic I saw, and don't hold me to this, was, about, it was that 1,500 cyber companies have been started up by venture funding in the last three years, right? That's a phenomenally large number. Um, that's the other thing, too. Um, we always remember the survivors, the Googles, the Facebooks, the et cetera, which you don't see are the 97 Moogles, Doogles, Poogles, and et cetera, that sort of, you know, that went by the wayside, right? And everybody thinks, oh, well, you always get to, to that size, right? And, and that's one of the other cultural things that will have to be different that, again, has nothing to do with money. We set the bar so high for success on the defense side that once something comes over the bar, we tend to defend it regardless of what's going on because it was so painful getting it to that point. Silicon Valley is exactly the opposite. Very wide aperture, taken as much as you can, but extremely quick kill mechanisms by which if something begins to stumble and fail, you shoot it and you move on. That is not how DOD works. And so that I would once again submit to you that has less to do with money and once again with, with cultural behaviors in some ways than, than that. Um, and the last sort of point to make is that the sources of capital, um, which I, I alluded to relative to, again, the venture capitalists, for the startup companies that want to be purely in defense, it's extremely hard to find up startup capital from true venture capitalists. You can find it in certain pockets, um, and the government has, you know, has done a decent job, actually, at, at setting up mechanisms such as SBIRs, or in QTEL and, and some others, but it is not of the scale that the broader sort of innovation e e economy is able to tap into. It's extremely difficult to sort of get any kind of debt financing for, for, for these kinds of companies um, in any case. And so the, 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 the incubation of these kinds of pure defense technologies we find is generally either tapping into angel money, former defense people that understand the sector, willing to put capital to it, the handful of defense venture capitalists, or they're grown inside the larger defense companies and spun out, or as a dual use. And that the, the last is probably the one that, that where everybody's trying as hard as they can in order to do. Um, the middle of the curve, which is really the heart of the defense industry in terms of numbers of companies, um, not so much in terms of revenues. The bulk of the revenues of the defense industry is actually on the right-hand side of the curve. Uh, but in terms of numbers of the company, um, here we have the issue of the, uh, and, and this is a good thing to the extent of there's lots of programs that have been in research and development over the last decade that are turning into production. Um, that's part of the budgetary dilemma that we have is can we afford all these things going into production. But the real question that, that this side of the industry is beginning to ask is, well, what's the payoff for independent research and development relative to all the other uses of capital that I can do to the extent that right now my core focus should be actually moving more towards less about restarting new uh, products and investing in new products, but more about how do I get efficient in what it is that I'm trying to produce? How do I make it cheaper for the customer to buy it? Um, 
And the dilemma here, and the dilemma that investors are, because here, uh, uh, frankly, investors are starting to sit there and say, now it's time for us to finally reap the rewards of this long period of research development and time for you to climbing up the curve. And we actually, we want to see longer production runs and we want to see the margins coming off of it, right? Because we've inherently embedded a bargain that again has been culturally evolved over the last 40 years. It's not in the FAR, it's in culture that you take it on the chin in research and development, you make four to eight percent and you make it up in production where you're allowed to make mid-teens. If you actually look in the FAR, you can actually make more money on, you're allowed to earn more money on research and development than you are in production, right? And so there's partly this dilemma of, of I'm hearing the customer, the Pentagon, saying that they want more research development. Meanwhile, I'm heading right into my you know, maximum earnings period. Um, and I'm, it's not quite too clear to me where I'm going to put that money back. One, I have fewer programs to bid for. Once again, it's a little bit less about um, how much money you throw at it and the fact that you don't have enough programs to bid for. If I'm bidding, on, if there's one bomber program a decade, how many things does that give me a chance to chase after? And therefore, how many companies can you expect to survive if they're only chasing one thing? If there's only one manned fighter every 15, 20 years, if there's only you know, one X, Y, or Z, it creates this dilemma, right? And on top of that, I have this LPTA and margin pressure that's been building over the last couple of years, which coincides every time in every down cycle that's, that's hitting them all at the same time. And so to date, um, we've been faced, frankly, with uh, 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 an industry dynamic in the, in the middle of the, of the curve with a mid, what I call a mid-tier squeeze. All of these elements of not really a lot of places to put your IRAD despite the government wanting to do that, um, margin, pressure on margins, I have to maintain a particular infrastructure in order to just be a defense company, therefore I need to get to scale as probably the most efficient way to do that, which sits there and says that I should keep doing acquisitions and, and grow larger. The little guys are protected by small business set aside. The real dilemma are those companies that are in that 50 million to uh, these days, I would call scale almost two or $3 billion in terms of that entire mid range that's facing the brunt of that. And the need to attract capital for this, I would argue, for this part of the industry is this whole issue about how healthy of a mid-tier do you have and, and what's going on with, with all of those dynamics and the M&A policy that the, that the building wants to set. And you're already beginning to see a rotation of the investor base that's feeding into these dynamics, right? To the extent that the investors for the last three or four years have been typically dividend or yield-oriented investors who have been very happy with essentially the, the basic financial bargain that's been made with, it, with Wall Street and industry. I know I can't deliver margin to you, I know I can't deliver earnings to you, and I can't deliver top line growth because budgets have been dropping. So therefore, what I will give to you is a return of a certain portion of my cash and a return of capital. And as long as I keep giving that to you and generating returns that way, do we have peace? Yes, good. Then that's the mechanism that I will use until I can see a return to budget increases or other things. And so now that, that the view of the street is, that they've seen a two-year budget deal in the beginnings or the thinking that we've hit a bottom in terms of defense budget declines, the value guys are starting to back away and the growth guys are starting to come back in, but it's now going to start creating, if there was a vicious cycle on the way down, it's gonna create in some ways a vicious cycle on the way up. Vicious cycle on the way down is, I'm a value investor, I don't care about growth, I just wanna see how much shares you're buying back and how much dividends, therefore keep doing that and if you change it, I will dump your stock. At some point, it's gonna to change to how much growth are you delivering? Wait a minute, you're not delivering growth? Hmm, you know, what am I gonna do with you, right? Um, and that's what we are, look forward to in the, in the next two or three years. On the right-hand side, the critical issue on this side is ha the maintenance of critical, what I would call national treasure assets that happen to be unbelievably asset intensive, right? Um, let's take Space Launch, for example, right? If we wanna maintain certain access to space, uh, 
it's just by definition a high capital, a very capital intensive industry, one that you could not get, frankly, the outside financial markets to step up to and deliver, which is why the innovators in space have had to be billionaires that are frankly contributing their capital in terms of trying to overcome that rather than in some ways the, the, you know, the normal markets. And we don't have enough volume in order to sustain you know, that. And so we have truly had to default to this basic bargain of, I will accept lower margins, I will accept lower volumes, you will cover my capital costs, you will cover my research and development, I will appease the street by turning back a portion of that in the form of dividends and share repurchase, and sell to the, to the investment community return on invested capital as opposed to margin growth as the basic investment bargain. And so here the question about really what's the payoff for IRAD looms extremely large, right, unless you can restart the clock. And now I tr trip into Clayton Christensen's famous innovator's dilemma, right? The last guy to destroy their own business is going to be the person that's currently leading that, right? And hence the innovators tend to come from somewhere outside the industry or, or asymmetric you know, uh, competition. And in some cases, the, the question that's being asked is, well, can you be a standalone business just doing these kinds of things, which is why historically you've rarely seen them as standalone business. They've been part of broader defense conglomerates, right? So um, General Dynamics is a, has been a steward of the Lima, Ohio tank plant, right? a national asset monopolist, accepted monopolist by the customer, but it's inside a broader conglomerate um, uh, and, and it can, it, you can therefore reuse the capital in a different way and you're offering the shareholders a different, again, bargain, which is it's part of a broader portfolio. And here the, the, there's the risk that as the investors in the middle part of the chart of the curve start to start to turn more towards growth, that it bleeds into the right-hand side of the chart where they don't have inherent growth to deliver in many ways. Um, and that's also, though, why you're starting to see the activist investor base starting to show up in these kinds of companies, right? Boy, you have a lot of assets. It looks like it may or may not be undervalued. Is there something you know, to be done in order to, to trigger the activities? And so with, with that, I thought, I, I know I kind of threw a rock across the pond and hit a lot of different topics. Um, thought it would be, again, best to try to sort of tease them apart and, and, and divide them amongst these different things so that we to ensure that as, as you hear these debates underway that, that the context in which they're occurring you know, remains relevant. Because in, in many cases what I've seen, once again, cause true problems is when we sit there and say, ah, well the fix is I want competition everywhere, and you try to apply it across the entire curve, and once again, I have, now I have a real industrial base problem. Or I sit there and say, I, I, you know, I'm okay with monopolists across the curve. I have a problem at the left-hand side. So, thanks. Thank you, Pierre. That was, uh, I think we may have to give out uh, graduate credits at the end of this session, so thank you for, uh, for walking us through that. And maybe, maybe some investment credits, too. Um, uh, a great kickoff to the discussion, and uh, I'm pleased to announce that we're going to have even more insights to come, uh, including more slides for those of you who are slide junkies. So uh, let me welcome our additional panelists. We have uh, Frank Finelli, who is a managing director at the Carlisle Group and a long, long time participant in uh, defense industry, defense investment, uh, monitoring, investing, and uh, being a steward of, uh, of technology and also a uh, former army officer. Uh, so uh, has been a participant and a leader in almost every way uh, in, the, in the defense arena. Uh, and he's gonna uh, join us also to his right is uh, my deputy director, Greg Sanders, who is a fellow uh, here at the Center for Strategic International Studies, and as I mentioned, Deputy Director of uh, the Defense Industrial Initiatives Group, and he is our Deputy Director for Research, so he, uh, in fact, is the brains behind uh, much of the analysis, particularly of uh, 
uh, contract spending uh, that we do here, uh, and he's going to share some of those insights with us. So without further ado, I'm going to recognize Frank and Greg to give a couple of opening thoughts, and then we'll move into, into some Q&A. Well, Andrew, thank you very much. It's an honor to be with you here this morning. And, and Pierre, those were excellent opening remarks that really set the stage for, I think, a fascinating discussion about what's going on in the defense industry. And just for background, uh, as Andrew mentioned, I'm a managing director at the Carlisle Group, which is headquartered here in Washington, D.C. We're one of the largest alternative asset management firms in the world with about uh, $200 billion in assets under management. And we own uh, over 200 portfolio companies around the world. We probably are the, have been the largest investor in the aerospace and defense sector over uh, time uh, by far, uh, but we've done very, very little investing in this sector over the last eight to 10 years or so, and we'll talk about uh, some of that today. Um, so in a sense, the issue we're discussing today, although it's entitled the competition for capital, this is really about the competition for the financial strategy of the companies within the defense sector or adjacent to it. And in short, as Pierre mentioned, the defense companies have chosen a financial strategy over the last several years that has brilliantly attracted income-oriented investors while we sit in this zero interest rate world. Um, and if you could just go back uh, for a second, please. Thank you. Uh, in this zero interest rate world, uh, through the dividends and then again, the share buybacks, which have enabled the earnings per share in these companies to increase even though the revenues have been declining. And it's striking to consider how effective those income-oriented uh, strategies have been uh, for the large defense companies. So there's essentially seven companies in the United States that have 10 billion or more in defense revenues. That's uh, Boeing, uh, BAE Systems, General Dynamics, Lockheed, Northrop, L3, uh, and Raytheon. And if you go back four years, I could have bought one share in each one of those seven companies, and it would have cost me about $385. Does anybody know what it would cost to buy those shares today? About $960. So it's over 150% increase over that period of time. But what's really most interesting about it is that the revenues in these companies, when we look at the defense segments, have decreased over 6% over during that time. Uh, the earnings per share have increased uh, about 20 to 23 percent, and that's largely because of a number of different matters, better cost controls, execution on programs, share buybacks that have reduced uh, the share count to increase the earnings per share. But what's really going on here is that the price earnings multiple in these companies has doubled from roughly nine times to 18 times where it sits today. And so that's really the key, dem or the, what's indicative of the success of this strategy. So Andrew, if we could go to the next slide. And this is exactly what you'll see. A couple of charts from Warren Romine and the team at FBR on, I guess, what is your uh, left, uh, which kind of show this uh, big increase in the, uh, in this case, they're using enterprise value per earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. And that's just another metric of kind of the valuation of these companies. And this is across a much broader index. But you can see how much the multiples for these companies have increased, uh, whether it's defense product companies or in the services. But the other thing that is happening is that as the revenues have declined, working capital requirements also decline, so cash flow increases. That has resulted in stronger balance sheets uh, where these companies have had the discretion to return really more than 30% of their free cash flow in terms of dividends, well over 30% in terms of share buybacks, while M&A, internal research and development program, and, and capital expenditures have been relatively modest. Now, I think we should also point out that R&D spending across business sectors in the United States is generally declining. Um, and I know people are somewhat entranced by some of the technology centers that Pierre mentioned in his uh, remarks where firms do invest a tremendous amount in research and development as they are developing their platforms, and primarily in software-intensive platforms, you'll see this very, very high R&D early on in product development cycles. But then as they go to market, they often enjoy 70% plus margins on those products. And so, again, you have to understand the dynamics of that business model and why R&D is uh, much, much higher for early stage companies. I'd also say that multi-industrial companies such as United Technologies, 
um, do have high R&D in certain of their sectors. And so, again, there's a sector by sector, stage by stage aspect that people have to consider in terms of the amount of uh, research and development which might be appropriate. But I think the key thing here is that what both investors and the CEOs of these companies figured out is that as we sit in the zero return world, they had the discretion to pay high dividends that would attract income oriented investors and they had strong balance sheets that were very under leveraged so they could continue to pay high dividends and buy back shares for a long time and that created a compelling uh, investment opportunity for some classes of investors. Um, so the good news is that these balance sheets have a lot of strength to them, which can be used for a number of different things. The bad news is that the balance sheets are relatively inefficient. They're under leveraged and so the return on equity is relatively low across this sector, which is another reason that it may be hard to attract certain classes of investors. Next slide, please. Now this chart uh, shows a couple of slides from uh, Carter Copeland and the team at Barclays. And it just indicates a significant run-up that you see in defense multiples here. And so, you, particularly of late, you see uh, that great increase on the uh, left-hand chart. But on the right-hand side, you see that actually defense multiples for, for the index that they follow is trading at a higher multiple than the S&P 500 is. And so when you look at the characteristics of the U.S. economy growing 2 to 2.5% compared to the defense sector, where investment revenues have not been growing at all. In fact, Bloomberg had a very interesting uh, report last week that said that contracts uh, from 2011 to 2015 are down 28 percent. Um, now, outlays haven't been down that far, but again, what that's telling you is that uh, you know, DOD is eating more of every discretionary dollar, and the contracting opportunity for the addressable market is becoming tighter and tighter. So again, the, the rationale for the defense sector to be trading at higher multiples than the general U.S. economy is something that I think folks have to uh, consider. And, and the bottom line is that there really are four classes of investors. You have income-oriented investors, you have value-oriented investors, you have growth-oriented investors, and then you have investors that are looking to acquire companies, whether those are other companies themselves or financial uh, investors like, uh, like the Carlyle Group. But what we have basically seen is that this investor base has changed tremendously for defense companies since the Great Recession. And that's where income investors have come into the sector, attracted by these high dividends. And I think what we have to look at is the dividends today, whether they're 2% to 5% in the case of BAE Systems, very attractive today. But as interest rates rise, and at some point they will, I mean, undoubtedly they're going to stay low for a while would be my guess. But at some point, interest rates will rise, and then income investors have other alternatives besides the dividends on these stocks. And as income-oriented investors leave this sector, the question is, what other class of investor comes back to replace them? And I think this is where there is a particular challenge. Um, you can think about value-oriented investors, but if you, again, if you look at this chart where these multiples are at 60-year highs, it may take a big drop in the prices of these stocks for value-oriented investors to become interested again. We certainly don't want that. And if you want to attract growth investors, then you have to start growing. I mean, again, we've got top lines that have been declining these companies. So th this is the fundamental challenge that I think um, CEOs confront. And the issue is, you know, what do they do to try to attract a new classes of investors as they look forward at their companies? So if we'll go to the, last, to the next slide. And so, again, this chart is meant to kind of lay out the potential alternatives that are available to CEOs as they look at the financial strategies for their companies. And uh, it's pretty clear when you look at this framework that there's really only a couple things that CEOs can do. They can certainly invest in trying to increase the, the revenue that comes from their existing programs. That's kind of the bottom block. Um, the next area, which is shaded in that light green is exactly really what we're talking about today. That's the investment in innovation, uh, research and development to try to create new programs in new markets uh, to expand uh, the business base of the companies. Um, certainly that is one of the potential uh, investments that can be made. The third area is investing to try to reduce the cost structure within the companies and increase the margins. A lot of that has already occurred and it may be difficult to get a whole lot more in that area. And then, of course, the last area is acquisitions, where you make in external investments 
to bring in other companies that will bring new revenue, new earnings, new technology. And in a sense, what we've seen in a lot of areas are CEOs buying technology companies as a way to outsource and diversify their R&D, essentially de-risking some of it because they can wait until later stage of development to figure out which companies they want to buy based on the technology which is starting to transition into products that they can see visibility into programs. And that's really exactly the point that Pierre was making in terms of trying to have some linkage of this technology development into a revenue stream down the road. So again, I think these are some of the key considerations that CEOs have uh, been addressing. And so if we want to circle back to our original question about you know, the competition for capital, CEOs are looking for risk-adjusted return. And there's a couple of things that DOD can do to attract uh, this investment. And one is to certainly reduce risk. That gets at the value of death and customer uh, profiles, program visibility, so on and so forth. The other thing that can be done is uh, you know, expanding the potential for return. And that gets to larger addressable markets. And that's certainly something that uh, uh, DOD can also consider through certain aspects of their policy. So, one more slide, if I can. Um, today is, uh, again, the, um, we commemorate the anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And uh, I think for all of us who work or are in and around the defense sector, it's important to note at the end of the day, uh, for all these defense companies, it really is all about supporting that service member that is in harm's way to protect America, you know, the freedoms that we enjoy as Americans. And so, I just would uh, ask each of you to remember this as we think back to uh, uh, Pearl Harbor many, many years ago. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, Greg. Sure, and you can take the slide off, yeah. Thank you. Um, first off, thanks, you, uh, Pierre and Frank, for your remarks. Uh, I initially started at DIG under Pierre, and so it's uh, quite a pleasure to actually be on the panel. Um, so what I'm going to be speaking to is some findings from our upcoming defense acquisition report. Uh, this is building off our prior defense contracting series, but we're changing the name in part because we're shifting the focus a little more towards looking at research questions, some of the things we're discussing today, in addition to describing you know, the state of the contracting data. And for these um, four slides, I'm going to focus more on the entry and experimentation and the emergence of standard dominant design part of a curve. Because you know, in a time of third offset strategy, in a time of Secretary Carter going to Silicon Valley, that's where a lot of the interest and discussion is. Um, so next slide, please. So first, we've been looking, and we've actually been talking for a couple years, about the drawdown in R&D spending. And you can see a rather large drop off from 2012 to 2013 at your right uh, of the chart. Um, and from 2009 to present, we've had a total 43% drop off. The drop in, from 2013 to 2014, though, was about 8% or about in line with the overall decline. So we've been seeing a disproportionate shared R&D hit, but it's now starting to even out a bit. And then we want to take a closer look at, you know, this is contract spending. You know, how much are we seeing the very left side of the curve, the entry and experimentation, how much are we seeing further to the right? And the way we're getting at that is looking at the budget categories. Is it the science and technology investment? Is it applied research? Or is it further along, you know, advanced technology development, operational systems, et cetera? And the strategy of the administration um, to try to protect the seed corn, even though the budget caps provide some significant restrictions on how much flexibility they have, have been successful not in terms of preventing cuts to s and but that those first two categories, basic and applied, are increasing as a share of contract obligations. So they were 27% in 2009. They're up to 38% um, today, or 2014. And another part of that is, as Pierre mentioned, we are seeing a variety of programs reach maturity. Uh, the major factor is there future combat system canceled, uh, then wide, back, wide band gap filler, MOUS, F-35, E-2D, Advanced Hawkeye. Those have all been maturing out of the R&D budget, but there haven't been as major contract expenditures that came in to replace them. 
Uh, next slide, please. So in addition, I've done a look at Silicon Valley vendors. For this particular one, I looked at the top 30, as reported by the San Jose Phoenix and Stanford University. So the top 30 uh, were based on 2013 to 2015. So there's a bit of a bias towards um, for a companies. And also, we leave out some major players that aren't as large in terms of revenue. For example, InQtel, which is a big contracting player, but isn't really that high on that list. And the finding here is a fairly narrow base. Even if we're 10 years old, we haven't really found the way, you know, 10 years past when we really should be making the Silicon Valley move, we haven't really found a way to get a large set of revenues there. Hewlett Packard is accountable for about 70% of the obligations going to this category over a period. Um, and a lot of this is actually not R&D, but, well, electronics and communication is not surprising, but it's more of a service side of things. And it's been moving more to services in recent years. So we're probably more in the emergence of standard design side, maybe even the shakeout side, for some of Silicon Valley as is done now. I think this chart is not actually where Secretary Carter wants to put his attention. He wants more of the small businesses, the startups, but I think it gives you a bit of an idea of where we're at the moment. And while there's a bit of stability, I mean, we've seen Varian Associates drop off in the first part of the 90s. If you track that company, they split up. Varian Medical Systems is still very large, but not that big as a defense contractor. Beneath the category, the companies that are on this chart, you have a lot of tumult. Um, we've had Intel, Network Appliance, VMware, Symantec, Synex, all jump into some level of contracting, still in the like 10 million to 30 million range, and then jump out again. Um, that if you stay below 30 to 50 million of revenue, you don't seem to actually make the, find a way to do the cultural adjustment, that it's worth it to keep staying in. So that's a fairly high buried entry. Um, Cisco has actually just jumped in. See the little blip in the bottom right of other major Silicon Valley vendors? So one question, you know, if my theory is right that as you get above 30 to 50 million, you're actually more likely to stay in. We'll see what the 2015 revenues um, obligations tell us about Cisco. And I think that if Secretary Carter's um, initiative is successful, you would have to see a much more widely distributed Silicon Valley um, set of vendors than we're seeing right now. Uh, that said, notably, this sector has largely dodged the drawdown and the budget caps. Um, there's been a bit of a decline in the budget cap years um, for everyone but HP. And if you look on the right, um, across all the components, the Air Force, Army, and other DOD take a little bit of a hit in 2013, 2014. But still, compared to the rest of DOD contracting, they're doing pretty well. Next slide, please. So one other area, and you know, if you read two reports on DOD contracting, I would recommend the performance of the defense industrial base uh, done by um, Frank Kendall, uh, Mr. Kendall Shop. And he actually has looked at it, you know, the 2014 report found that as is, one of the things that concerns them is there's not as strong of a tie between performance on schedule and cost and profit. And one of the big things they're trying to do is increase the tie you know, make it so that there's a better incentive for the various investors to desire, you know, greater cost controls and schedule performance because it would be translated into profit. And they found that fixed price versus cost plus, no real relationship there, you know. One of the big battles might not actually be the question we're supposed to be asking. Instead, they really think incentive, uh, that fee matters. And so both, you know, the rightmost category on the left chart uh, formulaic incentive means fixed price incentive fee and cost plus incentive fee. So incentive fee means if you come in under the expected value, you get to keep some of that. If you go in over, there's a bit of a cost to your profit. Um, and they have found, you know, this is the development version, uh, that it is associated with notably lower cost overruns, you know, whether in weighted or unweighted form. And it's not particularly hurting the margins. It's a bit in the unweighted uh, category, but once you have weighted, so big contracts are more important, it has similar margins to other cost-based. So I think one thing to watch is whether DOD is able to better align 
incentives with the profits that shareholders may be looking for and whether that's one way, you know, while other culture aspects are vitally important, probably more important, that some of the gap between um, what the department is looking for and what capital investors are looking for can be bridged. So thank you. Well, thank you, Greg. Well, as sometimes happens in these panels, although notably more so today, the questions that I had thought to ask before we sat down and I, and I heard what everyone had to say are, are now uh, not sophisticated enough based on what's already been said. Um, but, uh, but there is one simple concept that, uh, you know, obviously we kind of set up with the title of this, which is the competition for capital. Uh, and the question, the kind of naive question to ask, and we'll explore it maybe, is if it's competition, who's winning? Um, and I'm tempted to conclude, and I'm ready to be uh, told how dense I am after uh, particularly, uh, Frank, your presentation, to, to feel like the traditional defense companies are competing pretty well uh, for capital uh, based on, on the results that you're showing. Now, of course, that may be on the verge of changing, and the message that, uh, that Dr. Carter is sending with his outreach to Silicon Valley certainly suggests that um, uh, that he's looking for some things that might be more on the left-hand side of, of Pierre's chart and that that could be a threat to the divisional, traditional players. But I would just like to get your thoughts on, is there a winner in this competition? Um, and if so, who's winning? Well, I, I wouldn't say that there is a winner per se. What I would say is that the CEOs of many of the defense sector companies really did a brilliant job defining a financial strategy and then executing on it. Um, certainly the run-up in the stock prices is uh, a result of that effective execution of that financial strategy. However, there is tremendous capacity remaining in these companies. Uh, they have very, very low leverage. Uh, they can access the capital markets pretty much at will at very, very low cost. And so, uh, again, they have the agility to adjust this financial strategy to address the needs of their customers and to try to figure out what they can do to um, you know, grow their companies going forward. I wouldn't anticipate that they're gonna be able to sustain the increase in multiples that they have had. But I think there's definitely ways that they can look either in addressing the defense market or adjacent markets that they can start to grow. And that's why I think corporate strategy is going to be really, really key for these companies going forward. And that's where there's a great opportunity for DOD to collaborate with these folks in the companies to see where they would like uh, companies to kind of place their bets. I do think it's worth noting that it, it, it is a deliberate strategy. It's a strategy that, that plays very well in periods of changing defense budgets and declining defense budgets. It was a similar strategy, frankly, adopted in the 1990s, um, in the early 90s, 91 through 96, 97. In fact, if you were an investor and you stared at earnings and top line growth, you would have completely missed the, 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 the play in defense stocks. In fact, it was at that time that a little known outfit called Carlyle Group was buying businesses at four times EBITDA and everybody thought that they were insane for doing that, right? Ha ha. Um, uh, and and it's, it's, it's the simple fact that it, during downturns, cash flows become more important than anything else, right? So we've had that underway. It's been a successful hold strategy, an explicit one, I would argue. Um, and one that's waiting for, okay, what's the next move in the budgets as people shift. So I would sit there and say that they have, quote, unquote, won the game. Um, they've also won the game because they were a better alternative than the rest of the economy. People have heard me use this phrase, but we suck less is actually, was actually a valid strategy relative to almost any other place to put your money um, in, in the general economy. Um, the challenge is not, the challenge will be that as Frank noted, as interest rates rise and there is, there is an alternative, and also the success of the strategy sows the seeds of its own destruction. The more shares you buy back, the higher you push up the stock price, the higher the multiple, the less return you get on buying that next increment of stock of that more expensive stock, and at some point it runs out of room. We've run the analysis, we figure you can go another 18 months or so, you know, 24 months, and so it's why everyone is beginning to ask what next. And, and this is where the Pentagon has an opportunity to set the right signposts in order to guide behavior in terms of where they would like them to go. 
mess around with that core strategy, that core strategy which is based on I will, instead of higher margins or top line growth, use cash flows to, you know, to keep the street happy, if you mess around with that in any kind of quote unquote acquisition reform, you're going to unbalance that whole bargain and then you're going to have some serious problems. And that, frankly, all the people are trying to watch for that carefully and there's certain things underway that might be undermining that. So one small thing I might add on the who's winning. Um, when I had done a quick look at Silicon Valley in terms of vendor location, uh, the biggest Silicon Valley vendor based on zip code is Lockheed Martin. But that's actually where the headquarters are. And the big six themselves actually um, come in a little below Hewlett. The other ones come in below Hewlett Packard, but are still prominent there. So I think that reinforces that some of the big companies have found ways very effectively to weather this. Well, let me uh, maybe build on that with with one more question. So, uh, Pierre, I think you really brought this idea out very very strongly that uh, it appears uh, very likely, or you've you've suggested that we're at a transition point, and that there's a that we're going to need a new strategy. That the industry as a whole, take leave aside any individual company. Um, that some new strategies are going to be required to be successful and they're going to be required pretty soon. Well, along comes something that is a strategy. It's called third offset strategy that uh, the department has now been working on for a little over a year. Um, obviously, the public release of that has been um, limited, would be maybe a, a, a polite term, very limited, um, but there has been some discussion. Uh, for those who either went to or have had a chance to look at uh, what uh, Bob Work said at the Reagan National Defense Forum, where he talked for about an hour, uh, about half an hour longer than planned, which I appreciated, uh, about the third offset strategy, um, he, he did make reference to certain technologies, uh, data analytics, uh, human machine teaming, and a lot of technologies that seem to me to be very much on the left hand side of your chart. Uh, Pierre, and, and not things that at least um, from what you see every day in terms of products, that it's obvious where traditional players stand. I, I, I try to couch that carefully because I don't mean to suggest that they aren't good at these technologies because for all I know, they're world beaters in these technologies um, in their private and internal R&D efforts, which they've chosen not to reveal to the world for, for clear reasons. But, uh, but we just don't know. It's hard to assess that question. Um, and so uh, with that long interlude, my, my question is, um, do you feel like, and you mentioned the Pentagon should shape this strategy and this transition. Uh, do you feel like that shaping is happening? Is third offset that shaping? Is it necessary but not sufficient? Uh, give me your reaction. Um, so, you know, part of shaping and part of the signaling is, is literally that, signaling and, and making commentary. Um, and the difficulty of industry talking with its customer because of fear of, you know, the lawyer sending you to jail has certainly interfered with that over the last sort of decade, you know, a little bit more. Um, uh, uh, so anytime the, the building is as loud about certain things, I think, is, is welcome. Um, you're seeing some people reacting. I mean, uh, uh, you, you mentioned West Bush, for example. I mean, Northrop Grumman is increasing research and internal research development. Um, I wouldn't, though, there, there's a little bit of a misnomer or I think a misperception or misconception about, you know, what the big guys are meant to do or supposed to do or what innovation looks like for them, right? Because if you think about it, the big guys have historically never been about the sources of raw technology. They've always been about who can leverage that raw technology and refine it into a product and put it to good use, right, and de develop into a product at scale. And I emphasize the word at scale. You cannot have a little startup do the gig, for example, right, because the scale isn't there. Um, and so the, uh, it is an extremely viable strategy um, for the larger players to sit there and watch and see who evolves amongst the left-hand side of the chart and frankly acquire them, right? Substituting M&A for IRAD. Um, it's a well-known strategy, for example, in the biotech pharma industry, right? The big pharma guys don't invent lots of new drugs. It's the biotech guys that are doing it. And then they get absorbed into larger pharmaceutical that has the distribution mechanism. If you want to think of the defense industry's distribution mechanism as Washington Ops and 
DCA auditors and all of that massive infrastructure that would crush any little guy, it's a very viable strategy to be an integrator of innovative technologies, whether it comes from defense or commercial, right, as one. I think that's the role. Now, the instant someone fails to do that, fails to scan the technology landscape well enough, fails to absorb because they have not invented here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that's where you'll have a failure and someone else will rise to be there. The top players in the industry have not changed in 100 years except for changes in technology. I've not been able to trace, think about it, I can trace Lockheed back to the 20s, I can trace Boeing back to the, right? When did the new guys come up? When there was this thing called electronics, I suddenly had Texas Instruments, Raytheon, et cetera, and when was the last time I changed the top players? When I invented this thing called outsourced services, right? And healthcare, so Humana shows up in the list of the top 10, et cetera. So I would not be shocked, nor would I consider it to be a failure if you see the same list of names in the next 10 years, although I will take everybody out to lunch in this room and who's watching this video if a biotech company is not on that list in the next 20 years, because that will probably be the next technological change that puts a new class of companies in. You know, Andrew, I was uh, at that same session out in Simi Valley, and I thought Secretary Work's conversation about technology was, was fascinating. I also think that a lot of folks from companies probably left the, more, left the room asking themselves, well, how does this manifest itself into addressable market for us? Um, everybody knows what the POM looks like, uh, and everybody knows what the extended planning annex looks like on the back end of that. Uh, we're under Budget Control Act for the next, you know, however many years into uh, uh, the early 2020s. So uh, the fundamental question is, where does money start to become freed up so that people can buy more third offset, if you will? Or what types of programs start to be divested to free up some slack to support it? And I think this is the question that companies are left with. One other quick thing to note. Um, more than likely, a lot of this, the reason why we don't see a lot of it, is going to be on the classified side. That then becomes an important strategic thing on the part of the companies. If you don't have the ability to contract and work on the classified side, decent chance you might miss a good chunk of what at least is going on early, right? So I th that's, that is one nuance, I think, about sort of third offset relative to other things. Okay, let me open up to uh, questions from our uh, illustrious audience here. Uh, up at the front, we have a question. Sorry, you'll, they'll bring you a mic. Just briefly state who you are and your question. Yeah, well, I'm Harlan Ullman. Uh, I'd like to focus on the what next issue. Uh, the Defense Department budget has really gotten a two-year stay of execution. But after that, the roof falls in. You've got interest rates that are going to go up at least 100 basis points, possibly more. You've got huge internal cost growth, not the least of which is for people. You've got the whole nuclear issue about what are we going to replace, et cetera, et cetera. You've got declining numbers of F-35s. So where does defense industry come out in, say, two or three years when the bottom may well fall out? of the Defense Department because of these other pressures. And on top of that, you're going to have even more pressure to spend not on big systems, but after San Bernardino and certainly Paris, you're going to be looking more at people things that are not necessarily platform oriented that the big companies are so good at producing. So what's next, two or three years? Yeah, I mean, I'll take a first stab at that. It's going to depend where the company is, but undoubtedly, the management team see these pressures that are coming. And, and Pierre made an excellent point about kind of this small business part of the addressable market, which is being set aside at increasingly high levels, over 40% in some uh, contracts. Uh, and so, uh, again, you're going to have these uh, areas where uh, the markets are not going to increase. And so that's going to drive companies to make strategic decisions about, do you think you can grow internationally uh, so despite all the export control problems and everything else, we now have a huge problem because with the appreciation of the U.S. dollar, European defense goods are now 30 percent cheaper than they were 18 months ago, and Russian defense articles are half the price. Um, so the U.S. dollar is likely to strengthen as the U.S. Uh, starts to uh, increase the Fed funds rate while we're still easing 65 billion euros a month in Europe. Um, so the international markets are going to be a tough play for a whole bunch of, of reasons. I think companies will also find adjacencies 
Uh, they may be in commercial or broader security areas, but I think this is coming back to my earlier point about why strategy is going to be so important. Um, it's not clear how the addressable market grows in aggregate, so companies are going to have to figure out either how to take share or how to grow in other markets adjacent to defense. The stock market valuations are, Wall Street's saying that you're wrong. Wall Street's saying that it's going to keep going. Otherwise, those multiples don't make any sense, right? So we'll find out whether they're right or not. Um, uh, three years ago, they were saying, yeah, they were essentially pricing in the entirety of the budget downturn, right? I mean, and that's, that's the range of multiples that you, that you, you have to play with. Um, the other couple, handful of things to note, though, is that um, the lighter end of the fight is actually a cheap thing relative to the upper end of the fight. So we've been in that lower end of the fight, and I still have a good chunk of my, if I, if I redid that curve, not based on time, but based on dollars, you know as well as I do, that curve would be way shifted to the right, right? Um, as that heavier fight just, just fundamentally costs more. So I, I, you know, I think the, uh, uh, the industry is asking that question exactly. Is this a false dawn or not? Wall Street's voting with their dollars. Um, I think the, uh, the, uh, the, the savvy investors of the world are trying to figure out if there's, a, if, there's a, if there's going to be a differential. There's actually a fifth strategy, you know, Frank, which is, which is shrink to grow, sure. right? Which is what General Dynamics did right in the early 90s. They sat there and said, actually at 10 billion, I can't play this game. I'm going to take myself down. Now, if, if they had executed their strategy all the way, they will tell you they would have ended up at zero, and that's where they were heading. They just forgot to sell the last two, and so then they, and they grew back up from that. Um, uh, and you're seeing a little bit of that going on as well. So I would argue, and we've been arguing for quite some time, you're going to see fragmentation of the industry before you see consolidation, and it's a little bit of that. Focus on what you think can survive, can be sustained, shed things that are not. Others who will have a differential view will be picking them up, and it's from that you're going to get the repositioning of the industry. Yeah, the, the one challenge with some of these divestiture strategies is the uh, tax loss associated with some of these deals um, can be significant, and so that's just something that companies have to work through uh, from, a financial position, uh, from a financial perspective. And one thing I would add in, um, we didn't extend the graph we put in of you know, R&D to the 1990s, but while we have you know, dropped a fair amount, the 2014 spend is still above the 2000 spend. You know, there is a variety of pressures, and I think the ones you mentioned are very real, but it looks like, you know, probably one of the reasons Wall Street has some confidence is it looks like we might have bottomed out at a higher level than the last drawdown. Um, and while there's been a variety of investment strategies of, of returning money to investors, I think this also somewhat echoes larger American trends. Uh, a report by J.W. Mason of Roosevelt uh, Institute that in the 70s, about 50% of uh, profits went to shareholders. In the last 30 years, it averaged up to 90%. You know, there's been other companies pursuing this. This isn't a defense unique strategy in some ways, while there are a variety of things that are defense unique. And then the one other comment that I wanted to, to throw out there is, um, I think, to reinforce some of what Pierre has said is, again, when you look at market signals, and it may be an overbroad generalization because we don't have really sharp data, but you see a lot of product companies that have been in product and then they grew their services, and particularly during the, during the war years when uh, there was a lot of increase on the services side. And now some of them are shifting away from that, not away from services entirely, but uh, rationalizing or focusing their services activity more in line with their product work. And that would, again, seem to suggest that they see a future in the product business. They don't see uh, a, a big train wreck coming on that end of the business. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, great program and presentation, great analysis. Thank you all. Um, Jerry Howe with Freed Frank. Uh, my question, we've heard a lot about the uh, top tier and their public investors, and we've heard a fair amount about VCs and what the outlook in Silicon Valley and so forth. What about the private equity markets and uh, the middle market? Is it all about the mid-tier squeeze, or is there something offsetting that to give more optimism in that sector? 
and for Frank, what would it take to get Carlisle back into that sector? Oh, well, we remain very interested in the sector. It, it's all about uh, finding uh, you know deals that we think we can help uh, to grow in this environment. Um, I think fundamentally what we're seeing is the valuations of these companies from the perspective of the people that currently own them is based on comparables to the public markets. And as we saw, those valuations are at 60 years highs. Um, from the private equity perspective, we're generally coming to an impression of the value of a company bottom up across all their programs. And so when you value all the programs going up compared to these multiple based uh, comparisons, you often have a little bit of a gap. And I think that's really what's going on. So at some point that gap will close and, and there'll be more transactions But what with private equity. But what I would say is there's phenomenal capacity for the companies themselves to do deals. And in a way, I'm surprised that we're not seeing more strategic uh, M&A. One, it gives you access to a diversified R&D base, it gives you new revenue, but it also gives you some strategic optionality around what you might be able to do through the combination of your company and the uh, capabilities that are being brought to you through the companies that you could buy. And again, the financing costs for doing those types of transactions today are extremely low. And, and so where we're seeing, I would argue, we're, we've begun to see that this year, a little bit starting later last year. and. Um, ATK Orbital in the you know, mid-tier and on the hardware side, um, Task Agility on the on the services side, um, and the investors did not kill the CEOs who did that, which was the mantra 18 months ago. If if you do any of that, you you will you'll be punished. I think where the multiples are is making it hard for the large deals to get done. Um, you just can't close the financial loop which is why the mid-tier has remained really active. Um, I've seen, uh, uh, you've seen the dedicated private equity guys that are focused on the sector, you know, remain very active, the Veritas's of the world, um, as well as um, uh, generalists and new entrants that still play around um, and have, have, have come into it. Um, and there, there is the, 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 the number one operative game has been the, the discount in multiples just based on size. And so people are arbitraging the size multiples. I can still do a cyber deal at five to six times EBITDA for a $50 million, actually a $30 million under business, right? If you can scale that guy all the way up to $500 million, you can get 10 plus times EBITDA. And so the mid-tier players, are, they're simply playing that simply, playing that game. Um, it's a hard one, because you've got to do integration successfully, et cetera, you know, all the way up. Um, uh, so I haven't seen uh, dropping away. And frankly, the other dynamic that's underway is in the capital markets, in the debt markets in particular, if you're above $20 million of EBITDA, so earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation, so roughly a $200 million business or above, it's like 08 never occurred. You know, debt capital is relatively cheap. It's accessible. You can get very high you know, multiples of leverage. It, it's kind of surprising in some ways. If you're below $20 million, it's as if 08 is still operative. Right. It's still hard to access capital, banks are still leery, et cetera. That's causing another divide between what I would call the lower middle market and what others would consider to be the true middle market um, that, that, that's changing the dynamics. And that's a level of activity that, frankly, I don't think the building sees at all, right, in terms of the, the churn that's, that's going on there and the, re, and the repositioning. Uh, the other thing that, you, that you've got going on is a whole bunch of entrepreneurs that have successfully done done it once before or two times before going back and trying to you know, do another build out of the mid-tier. Much easier to do on the services side because it's fragmented, much harder to do on the hardware side, partly because a lot of the hardware side is on the right-hand side of the curve. And so you know, L3 did gobble up all the electronics guys, Raytheon did gobble up all the electronics guys, a little bit harder, although the, the war up ramp has regenerated a certain pool of, of guys that, you know, that now that we're looking at the, you know, at the trough that, that people are looking to consolidate again. I think we have time for one last question here in the back. 
Hi, thank you so much. Um, this is actually a follow-on uh, to the question or the response you just gave, sir. Earlier you talked, and not, not to quote you on the 1500, but that is a, a large number, especially in the last three years. How do you see the integration happening with that with cyber? Uh, as we see a lot of other actors that are entering into that stage, you're talking about classification, you're talking about a lot of people entering the space. Do you see that going to warp speed based on the growth of those companies, or is that still going to be more on the R&D side that we're actually taking our time to evaluate who's playing? Thank you. No, it's going into warp speed right now, and it's going what I would call hyper-Darwinian um, to the extent that um, <laughs> this is like, it's a little bit, it's not to the extreme of the dot-com bubble, the dot-com one, um, to the extent that you can have a great product, but if you can't break through the clutter in terms of, of gaining attention and all that, it doesn't matter. So, so right now there's a scramble, one, to make sure you have something that works, two, that you can get noticed, you know, and adopted, um, and 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 do that drive towards the emergent design, right? And so um, we're probably, you know, we're probably gonna have to go through the full hype bubble and bust. And just like it took Internet 2.0 to kind of get the real implementation, you, I think you're gonna have to go through that. And some would even say we're right in the middle of going through that phenomenon right now. I would just say revenue matters and earnings matter even more. So stand by for news. All right. Well, it's been a fascinating discussion. Please join me in thanking our panel.